Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. All right. How do we love one another? How do we not love one another? Thinking about the scripture. First of all, I was thinking about the negative. How do we not love one another? <clears throat> Verse 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. We do not always abide in God's love. Just thinking about some conversations that I've had over the last few years or even the last few weeks, I can think of remembering times when we protested against housing for the handicapped. NIMBY, remember, not in my backyard. We don't want those people. We don't know what they're like. Uh, the governor suggested Glenn Garner Sanatorium could be used uh, for refugees. And in the church that I attended, there was a great uproar over the idea that refugees could be down the road and they could be out and about committing crimes. Uh, a friend of mine at the shore said she didn't dare put her house on the market because in that area, everyone who buys a house sells it to Jewish people from Lakewood. <laughs> now, friends, that is, that is how we don't love each other. Those are some of the things that I just thought of. It. Well, we don't really do love each other. <clears throat> Verse 10 if you love, if you kept my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. Uh, is there anybody here who's really kept God's commandments, all of God's commandments? It, some people that have not broken any of God's commandments? No, I know I certainly am guilty of breaking many of the commandments. I've, verse 11 says I have said these things to you so my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be complete is our joy complete? I don't think so I don't think so is God's joy complete? how can God's joy be complete with the mass shootings that we have in our country the wars that are going on the racism, the sexism how can God's joy be complete when so many hardly even believe in God anymore? There is so much faithlessness. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus commands us to love one another. And he loved us so much that he gave his life willingly for us. 
No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. But we don't get a chance to live our, lay our lives down for our friends, do we? Those who do can be recognized like firefighters, policemen, Christian martyrs. But in the everyday nickel and dime living that we do, do we actually command, do as he commands us? Do, do we feed the poor? Do we visit the prisoner? Do we care for the needy? Well, we mostly do it from a distance. We do it a little bit. The further away, the better. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Verse 16, you did not choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Would you pray with me? Lord, may I decrease, that you may increase, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. This was General Conference Week, and some of you know I am kind of a metho nerd. I enjoy conferences. I went to many of them over the years. Uh, and they had a Native American speaker one of the mornings. They had preaching every morning. I, I listened to three or four of them. They were wonderful. <clears throat> there was an Indian preacher, and he talked about being on the trail of tears, and that they lost a third of their people along the, when they were relocated. And yet they sang hallelujah for the faith of those people, and they called it Ubuntu, Ubuntu. And that's the humanness that's found for the faith when we're together with one another. When we're together, that's Ubuntu. Um, and, they, and the Indian preacher suggested that we look ahead for the next seven generations when we think of what we're doing and how we're acting in this world. The next seven generations. Imagine what, what our care for the earth would be if we thought about the next seven generations, or even the care through this church, if we thought of the next seven generations, are we willing to see Jesus in all and to meet Jesus and to see Jesus? Well, I think we did take a step at General Conference this week to see and meet Jesus in our gay brothers and sisters. And you, as I mentioned, the, the General Conference removed some of the restrictive, uh, hurtful language that has been in our book for about 30 years. <clears throat> and I thank God that this struggle is over. Because I believe that those who have been called and who feel the Spirit of God call them to be pastors, if they have fruit, they should be allowed to be pastors. And early on in the uh, in the process of becoming a pastor, at the local level, one of the very first questions the district, uh, the committee is supposed to ask is, have they fruit? Have they fruit? Before they can go on to the next level, the many levels of the many hoops. If they're called and if they have fruit, I believe they should be allowed to serve, even if they're gay. And many of us, myself included, we were ordained and we hesitated because we thought that maybe that wasn't good that we didn't ordain gay people. Well, we weren't maybe sure, but those were our rules. So we did it and we hoped that we could work against it. We hoped that we could uh, soften the language. Well, it's taken a long time to soften the language. And it has not been easy, but we 
we finally have made some progress. Our scripture begins and ends with this command of Jesus, I command you to love one another. And that's put in the imperative mood. Not that it's an option. It's not something we're supposed to do if we feel like it. It's to be a deliberate response to another person with whom we know is in the family of God, in our family, human family, regardless of how we feel towards that person. Oh, many people struggle at this point and they say, well, how can you command love? Love is a feeling. If you don't love somebody, you can't help it. But those who say these things reveal <coughs> that they have a serious misconception of love. Our victims, maybe we're victims of Hollywood in this respect. We think of love as a feeling we have, of affection towards one another. But as love as Jesus speaks of it is far different. We can be sure of one thing. He would never command us to do something that is impossible for us. The secret is that we are to love. And he says, as I have loved you, we are to love with a life-giving force that flows through us directly from God. We will celebrate communion later in this service. And as you hear the familiar words of our ritual, we, pro we proclaim that we are offering ourselves as a sacrifice in union with Christ's love for us. That's what, how we love other people. We are offering ourselves because of the love that Christ has already offered for us. <clears throat> And that's what our scripture is commanding us to do. Thank heavens. <clears throat> Thank heavens that we are strengthened each time we come to the communion table to practice this kind of love. And how do we do that? He loved us because God is love. And he was dwelt in by the Father. God, he was in the Father and the Father was in him. As he yielded to that relationship, love flowed out. It couldn't help it. Because God is love. And God chose us. Since God is love, when we yield to our relationship to God, that love flows from us. And it will have the same qualities of love that his love has. He goes on to define the aspects of love that mark the quality of his love for us, which we are to show one another. And how, how do we do that? Why do we do that? How do we do that? We, first of all, must accept that Jesus has chosen us. Verse 16, I chose you. I chose you. Jesus has a picture of you on his refrigerator. People. Jesus says he loves us. He wants that love to be extended. Clinton United Methodist Church has a simple motto. It's on their bulletin. It's also, as you leave their parking lot, it says, sent for others. Hey, there's, that's a whole Christian thought. Sent for others. Sent out to love others as God has loved us. Jesus has prayed for us that all will be well. Jesus has prayed that this church will be well. I love what Julian of Norwich said, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. It was a deep abiding faith that she had. And God has created us to be joyful. No matter what our circumstances. You know, our former organist Mary Helen always used to say, don't let anyone rob your joy. And we know that evil exists, don't we? We know it exists. You can call it what you want. You can call it Satan, call it evil forces, whatever. But it does exist. And when faced with an evil or difficult situation, our first prayer should be, Jesus, protect me. 
that name of Jesus, calling them forth Jesus to any situation, that's our birthright as Christians. We call on Jesus to protect us. And in fighting against our own sins of selfishness, a critical nature, pride, gluttony, addiction, I believe we need God's power to overcome them. We will have pain. We will have misery. That's a fact of human existence. We are not promised a rose garden. But we do know that no matter what, Jesus loves us. And Jesus has already declared that he is our leader and we are on his team. Thanks be to God. And in the middle of something awful that we didn't ask for, we don't deserve, we lean on God to be with us and walk beside us. He promises that he will, and I know that he does. As Hitler changed Germany in six short months, he took the crosses out of the church and replaced them with swastikas. Bonhoeffer gathered the German pastors together in what was called the Confessing Church. They would not pledge allegiance to Hitler, but to God. And their allegiance was to Christ, not the state. And friends, our life in God is a life apart from the many things that tug at us as humans. Our allegiance is not to the state. Our allegiance is to Christ. It's a life set apart for being God's son and daughter. It's a life set apart <clears throat> for living in God's kingdom. A life of allegiance to Christ. A life where Christ's almighty power can flow through us and we are able to love others. And this is the life we as Christians need to accept and cultivate and practice. And today, my friends, my brothers and sisters, Jesus continues to command us to love one another with that life-giving force. We will have pain, we will have misery, but Jesus is on our side, and we are together in the Ubuntu. We are together with one another, whether we are on the trail of tears or we are here in our dwindling sanctuary, we are together. Is there a, something you're facing today, a decision about a loved one, you're waiting for a medical test, a plan of your future life? My friends, Jesus loves you and has already prayed for you. And Jesus has prayed for your situations. So this week when something comes that you didn't request, you didn't want, you don't know what to do about it. Remember, Jesus has already prayed over you. You abide in his power and goodness. He has chosen you. He will protect you from evil. His love will help you love others, even those who are unlovable. Our lives must proclaim that Jesus Christ alone is our priceless treasure. Amen. Now go into the world, the people of God, having heard a word from God. Beloved, may God bless you with the strength to love one another as God loves each and every one of you, that you may find the complete, total, and everlasting joy that comes when we abide together with God who is love. Amen.